support. Again, uh, my name is uh, Robin Hall. I'm the project manager for the React Home and JBrowse projects, and I work at OICR. So um, these slides are uh, released under the Creative Commons uh, license, so please reuse them. Um, and I would very much like to acknowledge that uh, these resources in these slides are created by myself and others. Um, so that includes Baronic Pearson, Gary Bader, Lincoln Stein, uh, Guanming Wu, and I've also incorporated some uh, slides from the EBI training resources as well. So this afternoon, I'm going to follow on from Baronic's talk this morning about and going from genes to networks. And a lot of what Veronica has introduced you to is very much applicable here. And I'm going to reinforce some of those ideals in the context of networks. Um, now, just as a sidebar, it's interesting um, throughout the discussions of the last few days, um, you've been talking about LOH uh, studies and things like that. Now, I did it a very, very long time ago. I'm not going to show how old I am. But um, in those days, uh, there was no reference sequence. There was no next-gen sequencing. Uh, it was all PCR, large gels, and radioactive probes. Uh, that's actually how I irradiated my eyebrow. Um, and um, much of the quantitative work was really challenging. It was not, you know, you talk about having hundreds of samples or thousands of samples nowadays. We were lucky to have dozens. So a lot has changed, and it's lots. And today, I really want to talk about putting this all into the context of networks, uh, network analysis. So by the end of this lecture, you will uh, understand the principles of network theory and analysis. I understand a little bit more about the sources of network data, uh, the analytical approaches that can be used for not just analysis, but also visualization and data integration. Um, and we'll give a little bit of an overview on the React FI interaction network and something called the React FI Viz Cytoscape app. Um, now they use this, uh, took this uh, image from a paper by Barbasi uh, many years ago, um, and it's a pyramid structure of informatics. And the idea here is, as you go from the bottom to the top, uh, the information quality and the level of that complexity is exponentially getting getting bigger and more complex. And the context of you know this network analysis talk is that it tries to incorporate um, prior biological knowledge to analyze uh, genes or proteins and other biological entities and groups uh, in a biological context. And um, yeah, as kind of Veronica introduced earlier, biological systems are often represented as networks. And these are complex sets of binary interactions um, or relations uh, between different entities. Um, essentially every biological entity um, has interactions with other biological entities uh, from the, the level, of, from the molecular level all the way up to the ecosystem level. Um, and biological network analysis has historically originated from uh, the tools and the concepts of social network analyses and the application of graph theory to the social sciences. Um, now, my take on the uh, definition of a network analysis, it's an analytical technique that makes use of biological or molecular network information to gain insights into a biological system. Um, can I say this every year? It's a rapidly evolving field. It still is. I mean, there's just it's just adjusting to the new technologies, uh, the new types of data, you know, high throughput technologies have changed. Um, and you know, analysis tools have to have to evolve to meet that need. And so there are many, many different types of approaches available. Um, and the reasons we do this um, uh, really are, they're intuitive to scientists, uh, just like pathways. Um, you can analyze multiple data types in the context of a network. And uh, there are a number of methods available to kind of automate that analysis, which is really helpful. Um, and I think network analysis satisfies a number of common use cases in biological research, uh, identifying hidden patterns within gene lists uh, for creating um, models to explain a lot of this, the kind of work that we do within the lab, um, predicting the function of unannotated genes or the understudied genes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the lab. Uh, actually, later in this talk and in the lab uh, about another project that we've been doing at React Home. 
um, and then establishing the kind of framework for quantitative modeling and assisting in the development of uh, or the identification of uh, molecular uh, signatures. Now, uh, the most cited reason <clears throat> that many use uh, network analysis is to help analyze the gene lists. Um, so just as an example here, uh, a number of people from the Cancer Genome Atlas project identified 127 uh, genes across 12 different cancer types, uh, which they classified as cancer driver genes based on their mutation frequency. Now, looking at this list here, uh, it's difficult to say what these 127 genes are doing and why the mutation may cause cancer. And what network analysis tries to do is allow us to map these genes onto biological networks and understand their functional interactions and their possible biological roles. Um, now, Veronique talked a little bit about this earlier. I'm just going to kind of expand upon this idea that the nature of the underlying edge information will dictate what types of network analysis can be performed. And uh, for this reason, it's useful to highlight the, uh, the, the main types of edges that can be found in, in, in a network. Now, the, the first is the, on the left, is the um, undirected edge. And this type of edge is found in, a, say, for example, a protein-protein interaction network. It's a simple connection. Uh, between the nodes without any additional information. And typically the evidence behind the relationship only tells us that you know, protein A binds protein B. And then on the right, we have the directed edge. And, excuse me, this is the kind of connection found in uh, metabolic uh, signaling or maybe gene regulation networks. And there's this kind of clear flow of information from one node to the next. Now, both directed or undirected edges um, can also have a kind of weight or a quantitative value uh, associated with them. And this is used to depict uh, concepts uh, such as the, maybe the reliability of that interaction, um, the quantitative uh, expression change that a, chain, uh, that a gene uh, induces over another, or even how closely related uh, two genes are in terms of sequence similarity. Um, and the edges can also be weighted by other uh, topological parameters, which I will get into later. Um, now, uh, different types of information can be represented in the shape of networks in order to model the cell. And different types of data will produce uh, different network characteristics in terms of the connectivity, uh, the complexity, and the structure of the, the network. And uh, some of the, the most common types of biological networks uh, will be shown in the, in the next few slides. Um, so metabolic networks are commonly uh, represented by two types of nodes, enzymes and substrates. Um, Met, uh, metabolites and enzymes are the nodes, and the uh, reactions are represented by the edges. Uh, reactions can be they can be uni, uh, unidirectional or bidirectional, um, and the edges can rep also represent um, the direction of the metabolic flow, or maybe the regulatory effects of a specific reaction. Uh, now, uh, now on to genetic interaction networks. Um, now, a genetic interaction is a deviation from the expected phenotype when combining multiple genetic mutations, uh, when the individual mutations alone do not exhibit that deviation. So this was kind of really shown, uh, uh, demonstrated in a lot of model organisms, and in particular in budding yeast, uh, where most genetic interactions are measured uh, using a single phenotype, and that is growth rate uh, in kind of standard laboratory conditions. So the example would be that gene one knockout is viable in the yeast cell. If you knock out uh, the second gene, uh, sorry, if you, yes, if you, gene, uh, yeah, second gene is knocked out, uh, the cell is also viable. But if you knock out the combination of those two genes, so in a sense you've got a double knockout, um, then uh, that is lethal or non-viable. The cell is lethal. It's, it's lethal to the cell and it's therefore non-viable. 
And so what we try to do there is, uh, you know, genes represent the nodes in these networks and the edges represent the relationships. Um, there is uh, genetic regulatory networks and it's common to represent uh, transcriptional regulatory networks with uh, the nodes being a combination of the genes and the transcription factors. And the edges represent the regulatory interactions that include the effect of the transcription factor on the expression um, uh, and activity of other factors as well. Um, there is uh, cell signaling uh, networks, and these represent essentially the communication systems that control the cellular activities within the cell. Um, signaling pathways represent the ordered sequence of events and model that flow of information within the cell um, and the entities of the pathway. So this could be like proteins, genes, metabolites, are represented as the nodes and the flow of that information, the signal uh, through the pathway uh, or the signaling pathway is kind of conveyed within that edge. And then finally, uh, it's the protein-protein interaction networks, uh, probably the most commonly used interaction network in biological research. Uh, it's a graphical representation of the physical contacts between the proteins uh, in a cell um, or, or uh, um, or actually it could be also an entire organism. Uh, the protein interactions are essential to almost every process in the cell. So understanding the protein-protein interactions is crucial for understanding uh, cell physiology in normal um, and in uh, cancer and other disease states. Protein-protein interaction information can represent both transient and stable interactions uh, I think of stable interactions as those associated with protein complexes like the ribosome or hemoglobin in the blood. And then you've got these kind of transient interactions that are like the brief interactions. And these may well modify or carry a protein leading to some other further change. So these are things like protein kinases or nuclear pore uh, importance. And they constitute the kind of most dynamic part of the interactome. And the interactome is that kind of totality of the protein-protein interactions that happen either within the cell or within a specific biological context. Um, and the development of kind of large scale protein-protein interaction screening techniques has created this ability to generate large volumes of interaction data and making that data available through uh, interaction uh, databases. Um, and these databases are really useful at helping you to build um, you know, your network, which is considered one like traditionally is one of the first steps in performing protein-protein uh, uh, interaction network analysis. Um, and there are different sources of protein-protein uh, interaction information. Um, and you can obviously use, I mean, you could theoretically use, you know, you know, if you're generating this data yourself, you could actually use your own experimental data. Um, but it's more preferential to use it from a data source. Um, um, and there's a number of primary protein-protein uh, interaction databases. And <clears throat> uh, these uh, databases, um, database resources um, have a curation team and their job is to um, extract the experimental evidence reported uh, in the literature using a manual curation process uh, or a semi-automated curation process. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about text mining in a moment. Um, and and um, these databases are primary providers of protein-protein interaction data, and they can represent a great deal of details about the interaction, depending on the database. So that could be about the source, the type of interactions, the kind of, um, you know, the molecular entities that they cover, uh, you know, state changes, other evidence that, you know, that, you know, supports the interactions. And so one has to consider that when you're looking at these different databases, that there are certainly um, higher quality data sets based on gold standard curation processes versus resources that may simply just list, uh, provide lists of interactions where A interacts with B. 
and that's all the evidence that we can provide. Um, so the IMEX consortium is basically an international collaboration between major groups, uh, major interaction data providers, and they've basically agreed to kind of share that curation effort and data and data exchange formats, which are going to list it here below. Um, and these data exchange formats are used to support data integration, analysis, and visualization. Um, it's often necessary to integrate protein-protein interaction data from multiple sources, since I think no one database has a full representation of all the protein-protein interaction data available. Or, and um, there is also um, sort of kind of, um, how to say this, there's some inconsistencies in the curation styles and there's obviously redundancies within these databases. So I think it's important to be aware of these different resources and how they generate the data and the type of data that they, can, that they contain. Um, uh, for example, you know, is it, is it experimentally derived or is it predicted data? And, um, you know, some of the other challenges as well with these resources is that they're using different uh, identifier types. Um, and so you may need to like map different types of identifiers, you know, in order to create your network. Um, uh, now, I kind of touched upon this just almost a moment ago, and it's just want to expand on that further. It's, it's important to understand um, the type of experimental evidence that supports the interaction data. Um, since there are some methods, some people um, stake more reliability on some methods over others. Some question as to whether some are, whether there, uh, some of these um, uh, uh, interactions do actually, you know, even though they may be demonstrated in vitro, do they occur in vivo and vice versa? Um, what I'm trying to say is protein protein interaction detection methods have their limitations. And the question is how many truly uh, physical, physiologically, sorry, I'll start that again. Protein protein interaction methods have limitations as to how many truly physiological interactions they can detect. And there are, you know, and they all find false positives and false negatives. That includes things like yeast two hybrid approach, pull downs and mass spectrometry, and complexes where there's like sticky proteins that just, just happen to stick by things like actin um, or other proteins that are kind of very abundant within the cell. Now there is also uh, computational approaches to extract gene relationships or protein-protein interaction relationships from the text, um, either full text or from PubMed extracts, uh, sorry, PubMed abstracts, getting a little tongue-tied today. Um, now there are, you know, initially there were some problems with recognizing genes, for example, is hedgehog, you know, a gene or a species, but a lot of improvements have been made in natural language processing, processing and it's making uh, the text mining of these kind of uh, interactions uh, much more accessible. So there are tools out there called Pathway Studio, Path Text, and then there's the kind of text mining communities that support Reach and BioCreative that are trying to improve, uh, you know, these text mining approaches because it is much faster uh, than uh, manual curation but manual curation typically creates that gold standard data set for generating a network. Now, moving along to network topology, uh, you know, this is a key principle in network analysis as um, it's important to understand the work. So it's, under, it's important to understand the nature of the complexity of the network to extract useful information that you would not have learned by examining the components individually. Um, Analyzing the topological features of a network is useful in identifying relevant participants of the network and substructures that may well be of, of biological significance. Um, and you can apply topological properties to uh, the entire network or to individual nodes and edges. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Protein-protein um, uh, interaction net networks show small world effects. Uh, in other words, it could be said that the maximum number of steps separating any two nodes is small. 
no matter how big the network is. And this connectivity allows for an efficient and quick flow of signal um, within a biological network. However, it does pose an interesting question. If a network's so tightly connected, why don't perturbations in a single gene or a protein have a more dramatic consequences for that network? I mean, biological systems are extremely robust. Um, there's a lot of redundancy and they can cope with a relatively high amount of perturbations in, an, in, you know, in single genes or proteins. And in order to explain how this can happen, we have to look at another fundamental property of protein-protein interactions, and that's scale-free networks. So um, in this case, the number of connections each node has is called its degree. And the majority of nodes in a scale-free network have only a few connections to other nodes, whereas some other nodes are connected to many other nodes in the network. Um, so, um, if failures occur at a random uh, node, the vast majority of the proteins, because they have a small degree of connectivity, the likelihood that, that, that a hub would be affected is small. So the hub is in this diagram of these large nodes um, and the other regular nodes are just smaller here. Now, if there's a hub failure occurs, uh, so you lose uh, let's say you lost this one here, okay? Um, then the network generally will not lo lose its connectiveness uh, due to the remaining hubs that are existing here. Now, if you lose a few more hubs, maybe you lose another one here, there still might not be uh, much of an effect. But as you kind of start losing kind of critical hubs, say we lose this one here, then we're starting to run into issues because you're then creating a network, which in a sense is turning itself into an isolated graph. And typically what we see in these hubs, these larger nodes are, um, are um, elements of, um, or genes that are either essential or lethal. For example, the cancer link proteins are typically hub proteins. For example, uh, TP53. A path is a sequence of connections. Um, the distance or shortest path um, between two nodes is defined as the number of edges along the shortest uh, route connecting them. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that interruption. Uh, that's the second one for the, the workshops. Uh, it's, it's expected, uh, Robin. Uh, yeah, no, no, I do apologize. Um, so uh, centrality concepts uh, were first developed in uh, social network analysis. And what it does is gives an estimation of how important a node or an edge is for the connectivity or the information flow in that network. And there's, uh, you know, there are different metrics to calculate centrality. I mentioned degree a moment ago. This is typically a local centrality measure and doesn't really contain, sorry, it really doesn't take into consideration the rest of the network. And the importance that we may give uh, to its value depends strongly on that network size. Um, obviously, if it's a smaller network, we might put more focus on that node. And if it's a much larger network, then we may not necessarily put as much strength on that, that uh, node, strength, node centrality. Um, now, there are global centrality measures um, that take into consideration that whole network view. Um, so there's something called between, excuse me, between this centrality. And this is, a cent uh, this is where you have a central node that provides the shortest path between nodes. And these nodes are powerful to the extent that the, the needed information is conveyed between the nodes. And in, the question is, that obviously, in how many uh, shortest paths, and I'll relate that to, in a moment to these, this, this diagram here. The third is closeness centrality, and it's measured by the closeness of a central node to other nodes, and it's a useful measure that estimates how fast that information flow would be through a given node to the other nodes in the network, um, and typically that's your shortest path distance. Now, so if we look at in this example here, we've got a blue node here right in the center. So in terms of degree 
Um, it has dependencies to many other nodes like here. And if we look at closeness, um, the question is the closeness of this node to all the nodes. So if we were going from here to here, it would actually, it'd actually be two hops, one, two, or one, two. Um, and then between this basically is telling us that the nodes on the left here are connected through the blue node to the nodes on the right and vice versa. Now, there are other network features to be aware of. Uh, for example, uh, obviously the first is the size of that network and the number of nodes and edges that you might see that. Um, and then there's things like the density of that network or the proportion of the connections that exist. And finally, there's these kind of higher ordered um, uh, organization like motifs, uh, feedback loops, uh, cliques, um, and other small network patterns that are uh, overrepresented when compared to, say, a randomized uh, version of the same network. Now, um, one of the kind of more important uh, characteristics of protein protein interactions uh, is their modularity. And we'll be demonstrating this in the lab uh, shortly. And um, you know, high uh, transitivity or clustering coefficient means that the network contains communities or groups of nodes that are more densely connected internally. So uh, when looking for communities in a network, it's a nice strategy for reducing the kind of complexity of the network and extracting these functional modules. And these could be things like protein complexes that actually reflect the biology of the network. And there's several terms that are commonly used when talking about these kind of clustering analyses. That's the process of identifying these communities. Um, when, and I'll get to that in a moment, but one important assumption that should be made is that uh, we're not making, uh, there's no assumption made about the internal structure of these communities. We're just looking at high density regions. Um, and uh, it's also important to note that finding the best community structure is algorithmically extremely complex, uh, tongue twister, and is only possible uh, for very small networks. And there's too many to cover for this workshop, but there are a variety of different clustering algorithms um, some of which have been incorporated into the React Home FI Viz app that we'll see later today. And there is a variety of other um, apps available through the Cytoscape uh, store that allow you to um, perform this type of clustering analysis um, on a network. And there's things like Markov Clustering Algorithm or MCL. There's Fuzzy uh, C mean, Fuzzy C or K means. I'm having a moment of panic there. Uh, there's Chinese whispers clustering, uh, there's label propagation clustering, and things like new and uh, Gervin algorithm. Um, so there are a number of software tools out there that will help you perform network analyses and visualization. Um, obviously, you've already heard about Cytoscape. It is by far the best tool. Um, and so and a number of these other tools that we'll be talking about, again, um, they succeed because they're open source, open access. Um, there's a lot of plugin or application support, so you can integrate other data types or, um, you know, perform different types of uh, visual layouts. Um, and of course, many people in data science uh, and bioinformaticians are using Bioconductor um, and R, uh, or may well be using Python as well. So there is um, a lot of other tools out there um, that support uh, this type of analysis, some of which are standalone tools of multi-platform uh, tools as well. So you can use, run them on your Mac, PC, or Linux box. Um, and Robin, others do you oh. want to uh, discourage the use of Excel? Well, yeah, I, I should maybe put a lex over that. Yeah, I, I, I was, it's interesting. Yeah, the there thing is, a lot of chatter, there was some chatter on the on the yeah, I, I think it's, it's yeah. It, interesting. It's 
unfortunately, biologists still use Excel. I mean, yes. And there has to be within a lot of these network analysis tools, ways in which data can be made available, uh, tabular data, I should be saying, that can be imported into these tools. And unfortunately, yeah, I should, I should maybe scrub that one out. I, that, but I just thought I'd bring it out because it was brought up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I'm very much in agreement there. I've, I've obviously yeah. fell for that as well uh, yeah. in the early days. Um, but um, a lot of these other tools as well um, to provide, for example, API access or um, like, for example, uh, Cytoscape uh, and things like uh, through Python and I, you know, iGraph and Python tools, they, you can automate the analyses approach. So you can really kind of, if you've got a lot of data to analyze, you can basically, I'm not trying to say set it and forget it, but you can basically set up a workflow, press and execute button, and you can walk away and come back to the potentially uh, analyzed data at the end of it. Um, and, and some, I mean, I don't, sure, yeah. Excel, I mean, Excel is on everybody's desktop. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so commonly used. But uh, the issue is, is that depending on which mode your cell that you're copying and pasting into, it will rename certain genes. Oh yeah, like things that are March, will get rid of these, March is a good one. Uh, and set, set one anyway there's a bunch of bunch of these that get renamed and then all of a sudden you and then some people have had fun going back into publications and finding these changed names uh into people so they make it all the way to publications and oh yeah yeah and there's actually and some so high impact yeah, yeah. no there's some really high impact papers out there there um that they're back to the working on the wrong gene yeah and they've actually got away with publishing it until they've realized that, oh, that's not the gene that we're working on. And that's just because gene synonyms, well, that's also another issue of gene synonyms as well. I mean, be careful with your gene names. But be very careful with your gene names as well. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Uh, so yeah, wholeheartedly agree. I will, I'll, you know what I'll do is I'll put a big warning sign next time, slap it over Excel, okay? um danger danger <laughs> yes well yes i was gonna say a little time bomb there or something like that but anyway here's the here's the mr. summary mr. of like smith, mr smith <laughs> here's the steps the typical work in the workflow of network analysis you typically will upload your data uh to create a network um you navigate through that network you analyze some network feature that you're interested in like you could be doing clustering analyses and then when you've got those you know those modules identified where you've got those tightly connected interactions you then label those clusters with uh, you know pathway um or go annotations just as you know veronica was talking to you earlier about uh, pathway enrichment analysis and then obviously when you potentially um you know cleaned up your network image you might create a figure from that that would be part of a paper. Um, so in my final section here, I want to kind of talk about network analysis. I'm going to talk about a little bit about pathway network-based modeling. Um, and this approach um, attempts to infer how pathway network states are disrupted in disease. Um, and um, also at the same time, to potentially integrate multiple molecules, you know, uh, to integrate uh, multiple uh, data types. Um, that could be a list of altered genes, proteins, transcripts. Um, and the idea here is to kind of try and preserve as much of that biological relationship information. And there's traditionally two approaches. There's the kind of network-based method, which applies graph theory uh, to discover the relationships amongst the nodes and the pathways where each node represents a biological entity, such as a gene or a protein, and that edge represents the interaction between those node pairs. And then there's mathematical modeling, uh, which learns and analyzes the underlying network by transforming the reactions and the entities into kind of a matrix form. And that's typically seen, for example, when studying a large uh, signal signaling networks um with boolean as, as boolean networks or um ordinary differential equations that can be used for quantitative modeling 
uh, to describe small uh, sized um, gene regulatory networks. And then there's you know, flux balance analysis and stoichiometric methods that are used to model uh, metabolic pathways. Both of these approaches you know, kind of use uh, qualitative and quantitative measurements to kind of try to infer the activities of various components of the pathway or the network. Um, and it's kind of somewhat akin to systems biology. Um, and there's a variety of different types of software out there that tries to do this. Um, you, know, uh, you know, classical kind of pathway modeling was developed to study uh, and model uh, metabolic pathways. Uh, so there's a, um, it's a tool called CellNet Analyzer. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's actually a MATLAB toolbox. It's a MATLAB toolbox for analyzing structure and functional biological networks. Um, and it incorporates several algorithms for metabolic flux analysis and uh, other regulator for, and, uh, for studying the kind of flow of information through regulatory and cellular networks. Uh, more relevant to uh, disease um, is um, uh, Kinome Explorer and NetForest, or maybe networking. Um, these are looking at the computational modeling of uh, signaling pathways, and then specifically, they elucidate the you know, the flow spiralation events associated with a given phenotype or a disease condition. And since uh, gene expression studies are still very popular, uh, tools like Arachne um, you know, can process expression uh, profiles to model the regular networks in mammalian cells. Um, there's a whole host of um, Cytoscape apps available through the store. There's Amino, Petroscape that do um, other types of pathway and network-based modeling. Um, and in the remaining couple of slides, I'm going to talk about, uh, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about uh, something called PGMs, and in particular, a tool called Paradigm. So PGMs, or probabilistic graph models, um, are widely used technique in machine learning and statistics for modeling uh, complex dependencies amongst multiple variables. Uh, they use methods such as Bayesian networks to learn uh, how uh, cellular networks, sorry, to, to, you know, the, the use methods such as Bayesian networks to learn cellular networks from gene expression data. And you can apply uh, PGMs to uh, analyzing cancer network, uh, for performing cancer network analysis. And the goal here is to integrate multiple data types to kind of find significantly altered pathways or networks and to link, for example, biological pathways or networks to the activities of patient phenotypes. So um, to do this, uh, there's a tool called Paradigm. This was developed by Vasky et al. Um, and it allows you to inter integrate multiple sim simultaneous alterations. Now, in order to do that, you have to uh, create something called a factor graph. So um, for example, a single protein in a pathway is expanded into four nodes. So that node now becomes gene copy number, gene expression, protein level, and protein activity. So just as a, an example here, we have a small fragment of the P53 apoptosis pathway it's shown on the left here. And on the right now is what we convert that into a factor graph. So we have the gene, the transcript, the protein, and the protein state. And with each entity type, you can apply a different experimental uh, data set. And through integrative approaches, come up with a model. And typically, it's been summarized in, a, in this heat map here. So in the original uh, paradigm study, um, and this was a study of uh, glioblastoma multiformi data from the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. Um, they identified informative subtypes uh, for GBM cancer data. And so samples and entities were clustered uh, then into uh, using hierarchical clustering and admittedly through a visual inspection revealed four 
uh, different cluster assignments. Uh, the first being HIF on alpha is a master regulator of transcription involved in regulation um, to hypoxic conditions. And then there was two others where there was, um, uh, or two of the first, two of the three. So the next one, the second one was where there was two of, uh, two out of the three clusters uh, had elevated EGFR signatures and an inactive map kinase um, a cascade involving GATA interleukin transcriptional cascades. Interestingly, what they discovered was that mutations and amplifications in EGFR um, were kind of had previously been associated with high grade glioblastomas uh, as well as high grade gliomas. So the analysis kind of conform, presented with pre established evidence. So um, moving along now, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the Reactome FI Viz app um, that performs pathway and network analyses. Um, Brian kind of briefly introduced you earlier to the Reactome pathway database. Um, this is another um, tool in our in our in our uh, arsenal that allows us to um, support multiomics data analysis using the Reactome functional interaction network. So you can have a variety of different input data going into the application, um, and you can provide different analyses types. Um, we're going to focus today on pathway enrichment analysis and also gene set enrichment analysis. But uh, as I kind of previously mentioned in the last few slides, you can do Boolean network and probabilistic graph modeling as well. Um, so just a screenshot here, um, using the pathway visualization analysis features, you can load uh, the pathways that exist within the Reactum pathway database into Cytoscape, um, allowing you to visualize uh, the Reactum pathways uh, here in the native pathway diagram state, um, or potentially um, convert them into uh, a network view. Um, and you can use these visualization tools to perform uh, enrichment analysis on a set of genes. And these results can be overlaid onto pathway and network diagrams. Uh, we're just seeing the example here with the purple nodes, uh, the overlay of a pathway enrichment analysis. And oops, I apologize, I must have removed the actual uh, slide, but there is also a network view for the same diagram here where you just see nodes and edges um, and you get again the same um, analysis of uh, the gene list. Um, there is gene set enrichment analysis. Uh, Veronica introduced you to this concept earlier. It's very much widely used uh, as an enrichment analysis tool. I think the key point to mention here is that the whereas where Veronique was describing gene set enrichment analysis in the context of the gene sets that are used for the analysis being you know from the MSIG DB database and um, you know the encompassing many different types of gene sets, um, the the only gene set for the analysis uh, in G, in the Reactome FI Viz app is in fact the Reactome pathways. So other uh, pathways or other annotations that are available through other uh, MSIG DB resources are not available through this GSEA tour, uh, tool. Um, you can also overlay drugs onto reactant pathways. Um, this includes uh, FDA approved cancer drugs. So uh, using the feature, you can um, view uh, the target uh, of these drugs um, and also um, the affinity for these molecules. We're extracting data from the uh, binding DB resource and through link outs, you can go to that uh, source information and uh, view the supporting evidence for that interaction. Um, now, I'd like to focus a little bit more on the uh, the Reactum FI network and the FI Viz app that employs a variety of different um, computational 
uh, algorithms to analyze gene lists, uh, expression data, mutated genes in the context of the network. And the goal here is to reveal the relationship amongst these genes, uh, elucidating the mechanism of action of drivers, uh, and potentially interactions with rare mutations as well that consistent with data sets, and to facilitate some form of hypothesis generation on the role of the genes in uh, disease phenotype. So um, I kind of mentioned already a kind of functional interaction, but I want to just define that a little bit more in terms of what it is. So functional interaction is a reliable biological uh, network based on a manually curated pathway and extended with verified interactions. So the starting point is to create these kind of pairwise relationships uh, from the reactions that, const that are, that, that, which are the units of the pathway. So you break down the reaction into a variety of different binary interactions, uh, some of which are shown here on the right and the bottom. Um, and in terms of like on, on mass, how this is done, um, we import a lot of data sets, excuse me, from a, a number of other pathway databases, including CAG, Panther, NCI, um, and some other transcription uh, fact to target uh, data sources. Um, we train, we create a, um, we create um, a training set, uh, applied to a native basin classifier, and we use the features from a variety of other protein-protein uh, interaction uh, data sets, some of which are human or mammalian based and others uh, that are uh, also eukaryotic or other gene expression go, uh, go annotations. You create this kind of predicted FI list from this. You combine that with the annotated FIs and you create this ultimately this large functional interaction network. And currently we do this every, every year we update the network. So currently we have about 13,000 proteins and about just over 436,000 interactions. So what I'm showing in this slide is the, uh, how we're using, uh, how this visual demonstrates how we're, how the experimental data set, the, the, your experimental data is integrated into the React Home FI network. So just imagine this was the entire network. Obviously it would just look like a, uh, like a hairball if it, if it are a tightly wound ball of string, but um, you project your genes into the network and, and um, there could be different types of information. It could be uh, genes that are upregulated and downregulated or different types of mutations. Um, obviously those genes, those nodes, uh, there's edges associated with them within the network. So you can start, build, you can start building out these kind of uh, connected uh, regions. Now it's quite possible um, that there's not a high degree of connectivity in this network. So we can insert these triangles or these linkers and this just improves the connectivity uh, within your data set. Um, and therefore, you then have additional edges inc incorporated into the, into the subnetwork. And then you remove the way the data that's not part of your data set, and you're left with this kind of subnetwork that hopefully uh, explains uh, the, the gene relation or the protein relationships uh, in, the, in your data set. Uh, so going back to this uh, original. Um, uh, 127 gene list that I introduced you earlier. Now we're going to do some gene set based network analysis using um, this data set. So you can construct um, uh, an FI sub network for the 127 cancer genes. Um, and then you can implement. Uh, uh, what we call the kind of high performance spectral partitioning. Uh, essentially, that's a clustering algorithm approach to identify genes that are tightly connected to one another. Now, in the case of the Reactome FII network, what happens is the, the nodes within a module are recolorized. Um, so, um, basically, genes in different clusters are highlighted with different colors. And then to understand the network module functions, you know we can perform uh, uh, module-based um, pathway enrichment analysis. So it's basically just performing pathway enrichment analysis on each individual, taking the genes within these individual modules and just performing 
uh, enrichment analysis. And then you can essentially then take those labels, those pathway labels, and you know, um, essentially label these uh, modules with different um, pathway annotations. So you can see here signaling by EGFR, which would a signaling by receptor tyrosine kinase, looks like there's a cell cycle component here, a P53 pathway, and signaling by notch went and TGF beta. So we basically reduced, you know, 100 or so mutated genes down to a handful of altered pathways. Now, the reactive FI also allows you to visualize cancer drugs in the FI network context as a simplified relationship between the cancer drugs and their targets. Um, the loaded drugs and the interactions with these drugs and targets are rendered in green as green um, diamonds and blue edges, respectively. And once a specific uh, cancer uh, drug or target interaction is selected, a table view will appear. And this presents additional information uh, about the, the, the drug and the targets and the affinity for both. Now, um, by combining the react to MFI network uh, with gene expression data, uh, it's possible to search for network modules um, that are related to patient overall survival. Um, the first step is to uh, calculate uh, gene expression correlations for the genes involved in the functional interactions, and then assign the correlations to the, 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 the functional interactions to convert essentially an unweighted network into a weighted one. And then you use the, the uh, MCL network clustering algorithm to identify the modules. And then once those modules have been identified and potentially annotated, the next step is to perform some form of uh, survival analysis using Cox proportional hazards or Kaplan or a Kaplan-Meier model. Uh, and I believe Lauren will talk a little bit more about survival analysis tomorrow. So um, basically the take home message with the KM plots is that they're drawn and an example of a KM plot is shown here on the right, um, is basically uh, drawn for survival probability versus time elapsed for different groups of samples. Um, and then there's a log rank um, test run to check the significance of the differences um, between the plotted lines. And in this case uh, that we're looking at here, this is a breast cancer data set. Um, all the samples were divided into two groups, samples having uh, low expression genes, and that's represented by the red line, and samples having uh, high expression, which is the green line. And this particular module um, consisted of 31 genes here, um, sharing um, elements of uh, cell cycle, uh, cell mitotic apparatus assembly, um, and these the expression of these genes um, was significantly related to breast cancer patient survival across five independent samples. Um, and just showing you here, there's just two sets of um, uh, pathway annotations. Those in orange are from the NCI PID resource and the other annotations are from Reactome. And the conclusion from the study was that patients with low expression of module genes fared better than patients with high expression of module genes. So the conclusion here is that uh, potentially a single uh, network module or, uh, you know, or it could be a set of modules could be used as a molecular signature. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've identified a PGM based uh, functional impact analysis using the react fi network. And this allows you to integrate uh, multiple omics data types together. Um, the current version of the react fi viz app allows the support for four uh, data types, CNV, mRNA expression, DNA methylation, and somatic mutations. And the node size that you're seeing here in this, just this network view um, is proportional to the impact scores inferred from the model. And you can, you, you know, you can view a variety of different impact scores and observe experimental data um, from your samples and from the results. Um, the Reactum F5 exam also implements a suite of features for users to conduct a single cell 
RNA-seq DNA analysis and visualization. Um, to do this, we've installed a, a variety of packages. Uh, uh, actually, several Python packages, I should say. Um, and um, these include uh, uh, Scampi for routine single cell RNA seq data analysis and visualization, and SC Velo for RNA velocity based data analysis. And just finally, the remaining slides, I want to talk about another project that I was, I've been working on uh, that's been called the Illuminating the Druggable Genome as part of the Illuminating the Druggable Genome project. Um, this is funded by the NIH. Um, and the idea here is uh, the goal of the, the IDG project is to um, better understand uh, the properties and functions of understudied proteins within commonly drug targeted protein families. So it's quite frequently that a lot of experimental data sets, um, you know, have a whole long list of, you know, understudied, poorly annotated um, proteins. Um, so the IDG project uh, looked at the proteome uh, and classified uh, proteins into four groups. Uh, T-CLIN, uh, representing targets that had at least one approved drug. Uh, T-CHEM, which represents proteins um, that have at least one Campbell compound. Uh, T-BIO, um, represents targets that don't have any drug or small molecule activities, but they do have some biological function, and there's publications and data to support that evidence. And then finally, there's the, what we call the TDARC group, which basically represents the understudied proteins. These are targets that virtually nothing's known about. And the, the project with which Reacto undertook here was to basically develop a web portal to integrate resources collected from um, the, the target central resource database. And this is the database that underlies the IDG project. Uh, and we also incorporated data from other sources to provide a kind of pathway centric view for understudied human proteins. So specifically, um, our tools allow users to search for a protein um, and visualize um, the the, pro, uh, the you know the reactome annotated pathways and pathways that are accessible uh, via one one hop pairwise interaction. So just take a moment. Potentially, you could have a protein when which when you search reactome, we've already curated. Therefore, it would hit one of the pathways. Therefore, it's called an annotated pathways. But in another case, you may have a protein that's understudied and we've not actually curated. But it does, that protein does interact with another protein that we've already curated. And so in this screenshot, we're just showing a pathway diagram uh, with the overlay of the four target development levels from the IDG project. And you know, with a click of a button, uh, you can con convert that pathway diagram uh, into a functional interaction uh, network view. And again, seeing those four IDG development levels colorized. And you can toggle between these different displays and um, provide the opportunity to explore these networks and pathways and to um, integrate other types of data. So uh, in, that, in that sense, we can um, support the overlay of um, protein and messenger RNA expression data that's been collected from the TCRD, uh, which in turn has collected a variety of different uh, cell and tissue specific uh, expression data sets from a whole host of studies, uh, principally things like um, GTEx, um, TCGA and such. Um, and this screenshot is just showing um, the overlay um, of uh, human proteome uh, uh, protein study um, where the expression data set, um, in fact, I think I actually made this into a movie, so I actually can just demonstrate. Uh, oh, there we go. So basically, as you kind of click this little button here, which is the play button, uh, we're kind of toggling through each of the different studies. And you can see this, just I'll read from that again. Just watch this little bar here. There's different tissues, and you can see the expression of those genes. Um, uh, 
I'll just move to the next slide. And we've also kind of over, um, implemented features uh, to overlay pairwise relationships uh, together with the target development information. So we're using a Cytoscape web, which is, is basically allows us to kind of display um, this network view in this pop-up window and the functional interaction network in the traditional pathway diagram view. We can also view protein, other protein-protein interaction and protein-drug interactions as well. And typically we get a table view as well that allows you to uh, interact with the drugs, um, sorry, interact with the interaction data. Um, so in summary, we've kind of developed this kind of unique web portal uh, to provide a kind of pathway centric view, pathway and network centric view of the understudied uh, human proteins. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it there in terms of uh, my talk. I think in the remainder of the slides here, um, I have some uh, provided some URLs to a variety of different network databases out there, some other de novo network clustering, construction and clustering um, software packages out there. Uh, some more details about the pathway model thing, um, software and tools out there. And it says we're on a break, but I should really start by uh, saying time for questions. So this is again released uh, under a Creative Commons license. Um, and uh, I will start by saying the learning objectives of this lab module will be to perform pathway network based data analysis using the React MFI Biz app, and also to um, search the IDG React Home portal to understand the role of uh, understudy proteins in the context of React Home pathways. Now, the React Home FI Biz app. I can just take a moment to explain this, has many features integrated into it. And I do apologize, but I simply don't have time to talk about all of them today and to just demonstrate some of those features. But I think the most important features are listed here, support for pathway enrichment uh, analysis in GSEA, um, the interaction of, sorry, the integration of a variety of different summary views, such as the, you know, these Voronoi tessellations to give this kind of holistic view of pathways. Um, we've integrated a variety of different modeling, uh, whether that's Boolean network or PGM-based pathway uh, modeling systems. Um, we've construct, um, you know, you can construct functional interaction subnetworks from which you can perform network clustering. Um, you can overlay a variety of different uh, annotations from the NCI Cancer Gene Index or from gene cards or cosmic and some other drug annotations as well. Um, and through the new uh, single cell RNA-seq data analysis and visualization, we can provide additional support for uh, mouse pathways. And finally, kind of performing survival analysis to potentially identify um, prognostic signatures from your data sets. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, pathway uh, enrichment analysis. Uh, I kind of introduced this already in the previous lecture slides, but this will go into a little bit more detail. Um, users can navigate through the, the pathway hierarchy here on the left um, and display pathways here on the right screen. So basically a number of the features in uh, the Cytoscape app require a, a left click to, uh, on your mouse to select something and then a right click to see these pop-up menus. And through these pop-up menus, you can perform a variety of different pathway related um, uh, analyses and visualizations. Um, and so um, you can also, as I mentioned earlier, transition from the Reactome pathway uh, into the Reactome FI network view. Um, and you can see the kind of reactions here on the bottom panel here that contribute to this functional interaction network view. Um, and you can toggle, of course, you can toggle back uh, to the pathway view if you choose. Now, either from the functional interaction view that I just showed or the pathway diagram view, 
you can analyze pathway enrichment. Uh, you can perform pathway enrichment analyses, I should say. Um, when you select that feature, uh, you get this little pop-up appearing and um, you will select your data set. And that could be in a variety of different formats listed here. You simply press okay. And in the background here, we're just seeing the colorized like genes in your list uh, that are hits in the pathway are colorized in purple. Um, and the same would appear if you had viewed the, the, the FI view. Um, nodes would be colorized purple as well. You can also perform a gene set enrichment analysis. Um, it's a widely used rank-based pathway enrichment analysis approach. Um, the Reactome FI Viz app um, provides um, support to perform gene set enrichment analysis for Reactome pathways using a gene score file. Uh, the gene score file may be uh, a T-score from a differential gene expression analysis or some other type of score that can be, that allows you to rank the list. And for significant uh, pathways produced from GSEA, you can overlay the gene scores uh, to investigate the locations of these gene products, having extremely high or low scores. And um, to understand the potential um, pathway activity impact caused by these extreme scores. Excuse me. Um, you can also visualize um, cancer targetome information on the reactome pathways. Um, uh, the so-called um, uh, cancer targetome was constructed by uh, a collaborator of ours, uh, Guanming Wu at the uh, Oregon Health and Science University by collecting and then aggregating uh, drug target uh, interactions from four drug databases that include uh, Drug Bank, Therapeutic Target Database, IU4, and Binding DB. And um, the, he assigned three evidence levels to each of these drug target interactions. And these evidence levels um, are as follows the first one being just the, you know, the database annotation, the second being uh, the, you know, the database and some form of reference. And then finally, um, the database, you know, the literature reference and some form of, you know, additional assay to support um, the drug target interaction. And the user essentially, again, as the, as the interact with the elements in the diagram, they can right click and um, fetch cancer drugs. And you can do this overlays that you can see here in the background. Um, moving along, talk about uh, de novo subnetwork construction and clustering. Um, and you can apply, um, uh, you know, a list of altered genes, proteins, or RNAs to to um, to a much larger pre-constructed functional interaction network. Um, that I discussed to you earlier in the lecture, you can then identify uh, topologically unlikely configurations by filtering away the unnecessary interactions. You can then extract clusters of tightly connected gene interactions and then annotate those clusters with pathway and other uh, functional annotations and essentially reducing the, you know, the hundreds you know, of genes within your list down to a handful of um, altered or disease uh, margins. Um, now, the current implementation of the React Home functional, information, functional Interaction Network uh, app recognizes four different file formats. The first being a single list of genes here, um, which is the traditional input for Cytoscape. Um, there is also the gene sample pair file. So the first column again is the gene name. Um, the second column is the sample number. This is just essentially equivalent to the mutation frequency. And um, the third, which is an optional column is the actual names of the samples. Um, the, there's also the option to uh, upload an NCI mutation annotation file 
or uh, the NCI math file. Um, there's multiple columns and it's running left to right, continuing along here and here. Um, essentially, again, the first column is the gene name or the gene symbol. Um, and the additional columns relate to different annotations uh, from Ontrogene or whether the source of the, uh, the sequence data from the Broad, um, the NCI build and so on, the, the type of variants, the reference alley, the treatment and so forth. And again, the sample information. So it's a rather long, complicated file, but essentially um, these types of files can be uploaded uh, into the React MFI network. And finally, the, the microarray data file. Now, just to point out, uh, it should be a tab delimited file uh, with headers. Um, and the first column should be gene names as again, but each subsequent column uh, refers to expression values in the different samples. Um, so what I'm trying to say is you can't, if you have a spreadsheet or a, spreadsheet or a table that has gene name full change and some form of statistic, those files, sorry, some additional kind of, yes, um, statistical value, uh, these files should not be uploaded into the React MFI network. The microarray data file only refers to normalized expression data. Okay. Um, and so the steps in performing a gene set based analysis is as follows um, you upload, um, you select from the React MFI app the gene set mutation analysis uh, feature. You get this pop-up dialog where you can select the version of the network you'd like to do, to use. Uh, some people that have contacted us previously, our papers are in the process of being reviewed and they have to reanalyze re their data uh, from an earlier version. And so you can do that through our, our tool. Uh, you upload your data in one of the formats that I just mentioned. Um, you will select the data type. Um, there is this option to do sample cutoff. Um, so um, if you have a, a gene sample pair list or an NCI math file, um, you may be interested in genes that are more highly mutated and less likely interested in samples where there's only one, where, where the gene is mutated only once. So, sorry. Stop that again. You may not be interested in um, genes where they've only been mutated in one sample. And so sometimes the cutoff could be three or four or much higher. And then you can perform addition, select additional uh, features, parameters uh, to perform uh, the network analysis. So fetch functional interactions just basically allows you to um, add the edge attributes uh, for the interactions. Uh, of course, you can do, if you didn't do this now, you could do that later in the network. It's very fast to do this now. So it's easier just to select that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can use linker genes to increase the connectivity within your data set in order to generate that subnetwork. Um, so I typically, when I'm analyzing data, won't necessarily select the linker genes until I know, you know, what generation, what has been generated in the initial uh, from the initial uploading of your data set. If it's a small network, I might consider adding a linkage gene. But then again, if it's a much larger network that I see or something that I, can, that I think has quite a significant amount of data in there, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to select this feature. And then you say, OK, and run it. And you'll get presented with um, this kind of um, view in Cytoscape, where you have this kind of network view here. Um, you have this table view below, which depending on which tab you select will actually show information about the nodes, the edges, the network. And as you add additional uh, analyses results, uh, additional features will appear, uh, additional tabs will appear here. Um, you can all, of course use the Cytoscape uh, features that uh, Veronica introduced you to earlier today. Um, you can zoom in and zoom out. You can rearrange the network. Um, Depending on your interactions, you can select nodes and edges and view different annotations. Um, if you were to select the white space here and right click, um, you will get, uh, you will um, be able to access a variety of different network features, some of listed here, um, for you to perform downstream data analyses. 
and I'll talk about that very shortly. But first, I'd like to talk about some of the functional interaction annotations that are available through the network. Uh, so um, we do have some rather detailed information here. Um, the edge attributes are as follows. We do have the, the annotations. There is some directionality. Uh, and there's a score, uh, a numerical value uh, associated with the predicted functional interactions. So for example, the, uh, the arrow edges um, represent um, uh, interactions derived that are re reflecting uh, either activating or catalyze uh, same functions. There's, there's inhibition events that are showed by the T uh, bar. The solid line uh, illustrates that the proteins or the genes interact with one another as part of complexes or inputs. Um, and the dotted line represents um, the, uh, just the predicted uh, functional interactions. So uh, when selecting um, an, an edge, um, it will highlight it red. You can use your right click feature on your, on your mouse or your trackpad. Um, and the invoke the reactive FI feature, query FI source. And you can read about more details about the source of that particular functional interaction. So in this case, we're looking at a functional and an annotated FI. You will look at the source, the, potentially the reaction source or the uh, target transcription factor data source for that interaction. Um, you may get a link out to a database. There may even be some additional uh, uh, publication information if it's available as well. And when you select the dotted line, it will again highlight red, and then you can right click again, performing that same query FI source, and you can view the predicted functional interactions um, of, that, of that interaction. And there's, um, two, there's nine different sources of functional interaction, like there's nine sources to support um, the functional interaction. Uh, in this case, you're seeing one, two, three sources, three out of nine, but you've got a score of 0.96. An annotated FI would have a score of one. So having a score of 0.96 indicates that there's some reliability quality to that interaction and that it's more likely to occur uh, it's possibly more likely as a physiological interaction that occurs within the cell. Um, an interaction score much lower, I would say less than 0.5, um, would be certainly uh, low reliable, uh, would not be as reliable an interaction. Now, once you've created your subnetwork, the next step in the analysis is to extract clusters of these unlikely configurations or perform module. Um, um, so we run the spectral partitioning algorithm uh, from Newman and Gervin on the React to FI network. It's typically used for most of the analyses. Um, for the gene expression data uh, sets that you might be analyzing, we'll use the MCL algorithm. And the typical output of the clustering is dem demonstrated in this hypothetical network. So here before, um, all the nodes are colored green. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the nodes um, are recolorized depending on which module that they belong to, okay? And then once you've identified uh, the network modules, the next step in the analysis is to label these clusters with pathway or uh, go terms or annotations. So, um, Again, this feature of the enrichment analysis is accessible by selecting a piece of the, the white space within the, the background of the network, right-clicking, seeing the React to MFI, going down to the analyze module functions, and selecting one of the uh, annotations that you want to apply. Um, I would like to point out clearly that when you perform the clustering analyses, uh, you want to select the analyze module functions. If, on the other hand, you have a small network and you've just chosen to treat it as a small network, um, you may, and you've not performed clustering analysis, then I would suggest that you may want to try analyze network functions. And that's just going to treat that much smaller network as a single module, in a sense. 
Oh, sorry, and I'll go back again, and I do apologize. Now, the results of the um, enrichment analysis are these tables. Um, the first column is indicating uh, the, the associated module within the, within, uh, the network. Um, by default, the module numbering starts at zero. So bear that in mind. And then you have the gene set. And each letter here represents the, um, the source database. So R is for reactome, K is for keg, for example. Uh, and then there's additional um, uh, numbers, uh, ratio of proteins in the gene set and so forth and in the module. Um, I'll go beyond this and say that there is additional statistics performed in the enrichment analysis. As Veronica introduced earlier, there is a p-value um, and there's an FDR value here as well. Um, and then each, um, the nodes represent the genes within the module that correspond to this particular gene set. And there's a variety of filters that can be applied either to um, be more, to apply more stringent FDR um, or to restrict your focus to uh, modules of greater than a certain number of genes. Okay. Now, the other things that you can, uh, the other functions that you can perform on the React MFI network is to um, view detailed annotations for a variety of different data resources for selected nodes, or in some cases across all nodes within the network. So the example here is just uh, the overlay of data from the NCI Cancer Gene Index. Um, you can view at the individual node level. So you can select a node, again, right click, present this drop down menu, you select React to MFIs, and then you will um, select Fetch Cancer Gene Index. And you'll see here, just in the background here, uh, a list of um, evidence and annotations associated with this particular gene that can be found within the NCA Cancer Gene Index. Um, now, alternatively, um, you can apply these annotations to all the nodes within the diagram. Um, a, a slightly different feature here. Um, you will go to React MFI, and then you will um, select, uh, oh, I think I've actually reused the same, apologies, I've used the same image. But the point is there is a way to, I should have actually changed this, uh, this uh, selection. There is a way to select the, the cancer gene index for all nodes. Um, and you'll get a hierarchy of the diseases in the NCI cancer gene index here. And as you click on individual um, uh, disease, uh, disease topics or disease terms, um, the corresponding nodes uh, in the diagram in the network diagram that have these annotations will be highlighted in yellow. Um, you can also see from this um, uh, window here that you can also overlay uh, gene card information. And I think in the next slide, yes, I do have uh, the option to show uh, the overlay of cancer target home information uh, as well. Again, um, the loaded uh, Drugs and interactions are shown, they're rendered as uh, green triangles, uh, and di sorry, green, green diamonds, and with blue edges in the lines. And um, once you select a specific uh, cancer drug, um, there is uh, the option to show this display table here, uh, where there are additional annotations associated with uh, the drug, uh, the targets, and the affinity for the molecules, binding affinity and supporting evidence. Um, you can also overlay uh, annotations for the COSMIC database. Um, you can view the uh, variant annotations uh, for a selected gene. And this example in the screenshot is just for the TP53 gene. Um, and then finally, um, we have uh, here, uh, module-based survival analysis. Uh, and the idea here, the goal here is to discover prognostic signatures in disease module data sets. Um, the React MFI network app uh, performs two 
there's two server side R scripts basically that runs, you know, Cox proportional hazards or Kaplan Meyer as well analysis. Um, the outputs of that data are shown here. And, uh, you know, in the lab, we'll actually run through an experiment, uh, experimental data set, hopefully to generate um, survive uh, the, the Kaplan Meyer model and predict. Uh, uh, a prognostic signature from an ovarian cancer data set. Um, now, now, in the remainder of the talk, I want to talk about uh, using the IDG Reactome uh, web portal to better understand or better uh, uh, understand the role of understudied proteins in a pathway context. Now, I have to apologize. Uh, for the video content. Um, we literally did a user interface update a few days ago. And so these videos that I'm about to show you uh, do present a slightly different website page colors that might actually, so will look different in your example. So, but I think you'll basically still understand the underlying features of the tool. Um, I'll do my best also to talk uh, about the features as these videos run, and I may try to run some of the videos more than once if necessary, but um, here goes. Um, so the, um, the homepage uh, consists of, uh, you know, a variety of features that allow users to launch the path, whoops. Sorry about that, I just put my computer into sleep there. Um, let me just run that again. Since I have to stop, there we go. Try and do this without closing my computer. So the homepage consists of a variety of features that allows users to launch the Pathway browser uh, within the IDG website. The Reactome uh, Pathway browser as well. Uh, read some documentation and to search uh, for uh, proteins of interest, which hopefully will come in the next moment or so. Uh, and there's also a little bit more information about eliminating the drug or genome projects as well. So the search is this for NTN1. Uh, we're getting presentation of the results here in two panels. First is the um, hierarchy of the reactome annotated pathways. That is NTN1 is a known already by reactome. There is a pathway annotations associated with that protein. So you can navigate through the hierarchy of reactome. And below that is the annotated pathway card, which is showing the interacting pathways. So um, these are where interactions are. And actually, I'm just going to pause this just for a moment just to explain this. Again, just to remind you, um, the interacting pathways are demonstrated by the fact that there's a protein that interacts with NTN1 that has been annotated in Reacto. And so what happens is you can see here. Uh, there's a list of genes um, that have been identified that interact with NTM1. There's five genes. And so what we do is then perform a pathway enrichment analysis um, on that gene list. And you get these resulting annotations here in this table. Um, and um, you can, by clicking a link, view out some of these information. Now, the functional interaction score illustrates the strength of the interaction, 0.9 being the highest, one would be the best, but you won't see that for interacting uh, data, um, interacting pathways, and you can modify that functional score. Now, in this window here, you're seeing um, a ver uh, different way to, and I shall just pause for a second. Um, there is a variety of different resources being used as source information to generate the, the interactions that are used to link the understudy protein to the pathway annotation. And so um, you as a user can select uh, individual pairwise relationship data as your source information. And once you select, um, you know, you can select based on protein protein interaction information, gene similarity information as a such, uh, gene ontology information. And when you select that information, you can simply click the add button and this will add a little feature below. We're not gonna see this in this example, but you will see where you can start adding different data sets and you can then recreate um, these interacting pathway uh, results. So I'm just gonna continue again. 
and you can see all these different types. You can also see that there's available the cancer uh, data sets from the Cancer Genome Atlas projects as well in there. It's co-expression data. You can select the biosources. You can add that. Now going back here, if you were to collect, select a, a, select a pathway stable identifier, you're going to open up the pathway diagram. It's going to, this is just the overview as we navigate into the pathway view. And you can see that there's pink highlighted borders around some nodes. And that's to say that these are the hits. These are the, the, the nodes that contain NTN1, okay? There could well be, uh, with the way that we curate a React home, uh, there could be individual nodes or complexes uh, there. Now, if we just reload and just now do a search with uh, CLK4L, this is actually um, uh, an understudied protein. And so, it is going to interact with a protein that is all, that's a component in another reactant pathway. So it's a one half interaction. So we're opening the pathway view again. You can see all the events here. You can download that gene list if you wish, view it for offline store, off, offline records. Um, as you update that functional attraction score, you can update the list. You can also search for, for example, TP53 containing pathways. I've clicked on a specific stable identifier. I'm now seeing a new pathway. And again, the, the interacting, the, what we're seeing is the interacting pathways here. And you're seeing um, pink highlighted pathways or entities within the diagram uh, if they contain an interactor of the selected term. And in this case, that was uh, C, uh, CDKL4. So these pink nodes are these pink nodes are representing CDK L4 interactions within this pathway diagram. And the other thing, just to kind of finally mention here, is uh, as we've been navigating through these diagrams, you're seeing these different colors here, and these are representing the four distinct uh, developmental levels of the IDG program. So the red uh, are T dark, T clin, the dark blue, light blue T cam, T bio. Right, now moving along to the functional interaction view. There we go, starting here. So in the pathway diagram, the node content menu, which you're now seeing, um, contains two tabs, molecules and pathways. And it gives you more information about the selected protein and links to other pathways that this entity contains. And on any diagram, there's also this site escape view button, which I've just clicked there. And this toggles between the pathway and the FI view. Um, and clicking that, uh, the gear wheel allows you to select different layouts uh, for the interaction, the functional interaction view. And again, the protein nodes are colored in accordance with the IDG protein classification as well. And hovering over an individual node will present you with gene information or maybe the Uniprot identifier. You can click on nodes um, and you can right click and you see additional link outs to other resources that are relevant to these proteins. Um, you can look at the IBG, Uniprot, the Pharos target data resource which is the main repository of data for the, the, the IDG project essentially. Um, you can also close that window down. You can click on the edges. And at the same time as you do that, uh, information will be updated in the, in the pathway hierarchy on the left there. Um, the edges themselves can be directed. There can be an arrow um, um, conferring directionality. Um, and hovering over that edge, as I said, presents the user with different uh, information about the interaction in the edge. Uh, and right clicking on that edge will present you with um, a menu displaying uh, the sources of information for that uh, at edge. Moving along, that's there to overlaying data. Sorry, there we go. So, um, there's two types of data that can be overlaid onto the pathway diagram in the FI view. Uh, there's expression data from 19 different sources from the target central resource database. 
Um, and uh, the other one is pairwise interactive data set. And so what we're seeing right now is just navigating through six of those I selected. If I just go back a second, hopefully this works. There we go. Uh, we've selected a suppression type. This is HPM protein. We selected six uh, data types. You can select up to 12 expression data sets. You hit the overlay button. And then if you hit that little like movie button that, or you can navigate individually, or you can hit the movie button, the little arrow there in the middle, and you can start navigating through all the expressions. So it's an expression for each of the different tissues here uh, for this particular pathway. You can uh, convert it to the, the functional interaction view. And again, you can play that little movie again. So see the individual expression values for the individual proteins. Um, you can then select the overlay relationships. And now we can look at um, pairwise interaction overlays. And uh, you can select those interactions based on um, different relation types, data sources, and you can apply whether they're having a positive or negative interaction. And you can see the color line, the edge now changes to red for positive interaction, regulation in the interaction. Um, and through here, you can actually then uh, display these interactions in the pop-up window. And then and I'll go through that in a moment. But the other thing to point out is these little decorators in the pathway view allow you to view the, on the right, you're seeing, uh, you click that and that will show the protein protein interactions. Um, and if you click the one on the right, and I'll show this in another video, you can actually display the protein drug interactions, the pairwise interactions. And you can see here the table below um, the information about those protein protein interactions, uh, the overlay value in terms of like the uh, IDG uh, classification, but that's a positive or negative uh, regulation of interaction. Um, sorry, positive or negative interaction. Um, the source of the interaction, this is a string just to say this is biogrid, bioplex string, and this is human data. And you can obviously, when you click this little view button, it'll highlight the individual uh, interaction. I think that's the end of that video. I think that's got me into the next one. There, and now we're going to just talk a little bit about viewing uh, drug target interactions. There we go. So drug target interactions are overlaid by default on the pathway diagram by selecting one of the little decorators on the left side, um, this little purple one. And then you can see these nice little, uh, little interactive views with all these uh, cancer drugs here. Um, and you can click on the drug individually. You can see more information about that drug. You can click on the edge. You can see the drug target information in the target table below. Uh, and as well, you can transition as well to show the drugs in the FI view as well. And again, you can click on individual nodes or edges, and you can see that information in that display there. I think I'm actually ahead of myself. And oh, yes. And yes, if you click on a node, um, you can see you can click this little RX button, and you see this little pop up appearing again uh, with your interested node and all the drugs that interact. Uh, with that particular target. That's it. And then again, just to kind of explain a little bit more about that pairwise pop-up. So it allows you to visualize a variety of different interactors. To typically, you're just going to see 10 interactors will be shown. Um, the source nodes are represented as circles um, and interactors are represented as triangles. Uh, nodes are colored to represent the currently overlaid expression uh, overlay. Drugs are represented as purple hexagons. Um, the edges are colored and dashed to help users identify which interaction set the interactor belongs to. And in the pairwise um, relationship table, users can view all the available interactions, uh, the overlay values and interaction type. And in the drug targets uh, table, uh, users can view information about the displayed drug, including the protein it interacts with, the action activity type, and the interaction value. 